Yep, that's about how watching this video made me feel. I would like to go ahead and thank Kitty for the nightmare-inducing fan art, because today we most certainly are dealing with a nightmare of a video called Go Where the Evidence Leads from Stand to Reason Videos. This was sent to me by Shannon Q in what I can only assume is a bid for revenge since I introduced her to Christian counseling. Well, let's roll the intro. Alright, before we get into the video itself, let's go ahead and get some fan art out of the way so I can numb my senses better than any alcohol ever could. The first one is from Karma is Life, and it's my desperate attempt to find a portal to escape hell after Logic helped me deal with Discount Hovind. That is still one of my favorite episodes I've ever done on my channel. Next we have, well, me with tentacles around me. I, I guess that this is just more fallout from me being in Logic's episode. That one is from Kitty, the one who made the animation at the beginning of this video. And then finally we have one that was commissioned from Orla Seraph, the artist behind the piece is Mira Bison, or at Lazy Overload on Twitter. So if you want to go commission some artwork from them, there's where you can find them on Twitter. Based on this piece, it looks like they do an awesome job. Now let's get into something that's not an awesome job, dealing with this video. And play. Here's an illustration to kind of flesh out the difference between these two things. And I gotta give credit to Greg Kokel for, for giving me this illustration. Greg Kokel, the guy behind Making Abortion Unthinkable, Precious Unborn Human Persons, and Relativism Feet Firmly Planted in Midair. That Greg Kokel? Oh boy, this is bound to be a knockout argument, I suppose. Here's the difference between the methodology and the philosophy. What? I'm sorry, please say that again? Here's the difference between the methodology and the philosophy. Okay, let me go ahead and start out by saying that uh, this is every type of wrong. This is, as my new $50 patron Glitch has pointed out to me before, like saying that there's a difference between chemistry and science. All chemistry is science, but not all science is chemistry, because science is an umbrella term in which chemistry happens to sit nestled under. The creation and utilization of a methodology is part of philosophy. Philosophy is an umbrella term, and methodology is part of that umbrella, just as epistemology and ontology are. And speaking of things that aren't ontologically true, this freaking statement. By beginning his presentation by saying that there's a difference between philosophy and methodology, they're already beginning with an incredible incredibly disingenuous argument. But let's see if it improves. I want you to imagine a well-known person is murdered here at the conference. Let's say, just because it's so ironic, that it's homicide detective Jay Warner Wallace. The author of Cold Case Christianity? If you go check on the Atheist Ed's channel, you can go see mine and others' opinions on that piece of work. All right? I know, it's so sad. We all miss him. Uh, Jay Warner, he is murdered here at the conference. And uh, of course, he's so important that the chief of police shows up, the mayor, I mean, everybody's here, the forensic detectives. And the chief of police says, this case is your top priority. I want you to use your best forensic methodology to find the killer. Yes, this is something that would be expected in practically all cases. But you know what's not part of that forensic methodology? Psychics or other supernatural actors. And you know why? Because all data that is utilized under a supernatural framework ends up being inconsistent at best, or depending on the source, flat out dishonest. So let's go ahead and establish right away that supernatural anything would not be part of the best methodology for this forensics team. Now I recognize that this could be seen as a method of me poisoning the well, but just Hold it in the back of your mind as a nugget, that way we can use it later if need be. And the forensic tech detectives are like, okay, great. And they get out their test tubes and their rubber gloves and, you know, you've seen CSI. They're about to do their thing. And then he says, oh, one more thing. You can't implicate, you can't charge, you can't convict anyone taller than six foot. Does anyone see a problem with that? Okay, but what would his reasoning behind that be? Usually, if a police chief were to say something like that, there would be a couple of reasons why. One of which would be the police chief knows who did it and is secretly in line with the person who did it. They would know that the person who had done this vile act happened to be in the category of over six foot tall and therefore wanted to make sure that this person could not be implicated. Either that, or they're absolutely stupid and pulled it right out of their ass. In either case, there is dishonesty at work. In this situation, I would assume that a police chief would not, were they honest, say something like what you said. But if we assumed that they were, like I said before, we would have to assume that they had at least disingenuous intentions. And given that that would have to be the case, the well would have been thoroughly poisoned on the entire investigation. Yeah, of course. Well, I'm glad you agree. Because what if 
someone taller than six foot did it, right? Anyone here taller than six feet? I mean, yeah, a couple of you, myself, Drew. I mean, we're all off the hook, right? You're thinking, well, that's not fair. You have excluded a possible conclusion before even looking at the evidence. Correct. And then the next question to the police chief would be why they are excluding that. There's always going to be a reason. In the case of excluding people of a particular height, I would assume that the reason is being disingenuous. That doesn't sound like the right approach to find out who the true killer is. Oh, of course not. But this, my friends, is exactly what's going on in the field of science for some. And there's the straw man. So you remember when I brought up the psychics not being used in forensics argument before? Well, here's where that argument actually starts to apply. Now, a police chief excluding a particular possible conclusion would be disingenuous. However, a police chief excluding a particular method for discovering the possible killer, like using a psychic or a medium, is not dishonest because that particular decision can be traced back to the irreliability of those people. Psychics, mediums, spectral evidence, and anything supernatural is generally thrown out in a case because it always leads to inconsistent conclusions, or more often than not, flat out incorrect ones. The only times a psychic or a medium that has no actual evidence in the case can get the actual killer right is at the same rate that we would expect when someone's just guessing. And if your method is as reliable as chance, then you're either playing a luck-based character in D&D or you're using a shitty method. By trying to make the argument that science is excluding one of the possible conclusions is to assume that it has not ruled them out or to assume that that conclusion actually has explanatory power. In the case of a god, that actually doesn't have any explanatory power for the universe. Is there explanatory power for God as a first cause of the universe? Well, no, not necessarily. This is because any explanatory power that that God would possibly lend to the situation is completely overshadowed by the questions that are begged as a result of that proposition. If I posit God as a beginning of the universe, we now have a few questions ahead of ourselves. Which God? Why did they do it? By what mechanism did they actually start the functions of our universe as we know it? Would these mechanisms of inflation and expansion be exclusive to the powers of a deity, or could they have been caused by other means. All of these questions and more are begged or completely ignored when you try to use God as a proposition here. This is why, as a conclusion, it's essentially thrown out because it lacks explanatory power. God done it, as an explanatory mechanism, works about as well as a parent saying, because I said so. They're excluding a possible conclusion before even looking at the evidence. You're saying, no, 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 Tim. Those scientists, I mean, they wear the white lab coats. Not all of them. And now you're talking to your audience like they're idiots. You know, they're the objective seekers of truth. Certainly they would never do such a thing. Seriously. You listen to Richard Lewontin, a famous Harvard geneticist. Here's what he says. This is a long quote, but hear him out. Is it a quote? Or is it a quote mine? Only one way to find out, I guess. He says this, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense, and there are a lot of claims that are against common sense, is the, is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. He says, we take the side of science, in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, and there are a lot of just-so stories, Please notice how often he sneaks in these little quips here. This is a thing that I've done before whenever I'm talking about, say, biblical gender roles as a method to undermine anything that's being said or to prove a point. Here, it seems like he's trying to take any pieces of information he can take from Richard Leventon and use it as leverage in order to push his narrative on his audience. Because when he says something like the many just so stories, he won't actually quantify these stories. Especially in evolutionary biology. Except right there, but he's not going to actually demonstrate that evolutionary biology has any just-so stories. He's just going to leave it there for his audience to nod their heads at. It should also be noted that evolutionary theory is not what Richard Leventon was talking about in here. That's just being slipped in by the speaker disingenuously. Because we have a prior commitment. What commitment is that? A commitment to materialism. That is, matter is all that exists. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Does that sound someone 
who's following uh, truth wherever it leads? Actually, it does, because you didn't provide the entire quote, of course. This is, as usual, the tactic of the creationist. In order to make sure that their claims sound like they're backed by scientists, they will take small snippets of quotes from scientists and try to use them to legitimize their positions, even if the way they are interpreting that scientist's quote never, ever, ever coincides with what that person actually meant, or even comports with the rest of the information surrounding the quote. So, for everybody who's listening, here is the full quote. It reads, Many of the most fundamental claims of science are against common sense and seem absurd on their face. Do physicists really expect me to accept without serious qualms that the pungent cheese I had for lunch is really made up of tiny, tasteless, odorless, colorless packets of energy with nothing but empty space between them? Astronomers tell us without apparent embarrassment that they can see stellar events that occurred millions of years ago, whereas we all know that we see things as they happen. Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. The eminent Kant scholar Louis Beck used to say that anyone who could believe in God could believe in anything. The appeal to an omnipotent deity is to allow that at any moment the regularities of nature must be ruptured, or that miracles may happen. What this quote is basically saying is that, regardless of how unintuitive something seems, Reality doesn't necessarily comport itself to our intuitions. It may seem intuitive that we are seeing stars in the sky that exist today, even though we know, based on measurements of light, that many of them are actually dead. This is unintuitive, but it is no less the case. I swear I'm gonna have to eventually make a video called Intuition versus Logic. The reason that he brings up not using God as an explanatory mechanism is because, as I said before, there is no explanatory power in that. It only begs more questions, especially because, as is said by the full quote, and only by the full quote when in its accurate form, if God is omnipotent, then believing in him is to believe in a deity that can allow a suspension of the laws of nature. If you are creating a model that is going to accurately predict something, the ability to suspend the laws with which you are trying to work around is not going to be part of that model. If we observe a phenomenon happening in nature 1,000 times consistently and under the exact same conditions, we would then conclude that the phenomenon that we are witnessing is, in fact, the way that things happen. If we witness an inconsistency, then we look for the reason behind the inconsistency. A supernatural explanation will never actually get us to the real reason behind the inconsistency, because we lack the ability to measure it. And, more often than not, it's not even really necessary because we we always find a natural explanation for these things anyway. So why would we go with a method that has no clear explanatory power, when more often than not when we try looking for a supernatural explanation for something, we end up finding natural ones anyways? To assume that a supernatural explanation could be utilized in these instances is not part of any real quest for truth, and to claim that it is, is either ignorant or dishonest. Speaking of dishonesty, I would like to point out how often it is that when we look at these creationist quote minds, they they are almost always either taken out of context or there is an entire plethora of information surrounding, and in this case within the quote, that is omitted from the version in the presentation. It's almost like you have to take away the person's words for their words to speak for your side. No, absolutely not. And just as a side note, when people say intelligent design, that's not science. Creationism, that's not science. They are not talking about the methodology. 
You know, in this case, I'm actually compelled to agree with you, but not for the reasons that you might suppose. They're not talking about the methodology, because as I showed before, there isn't a methodology. A methodology would have to be used in order to construct an accurate model that produces results that we can use to see what's typical or what we should expect. If a given model lacks explanatory power, or a given model fails to make accurate predictions, then the model either needs to be changed or thrown out. And in the case of intelligent design, no model of the world has required God as an explanatory factor. In fact, actually, I would like to ask you guys a question in the comment section. Take it as a challenge. And if you are so emboldened to, take this as a challenge to make your own response video. Name me a single thing that does in fact occur in reality that requires a supernatural explanation. Note, I'm being very specific. I'm not saying that it's something that can be explained by supernatural or by natural means. I am asking very specifically for one thing that requires a supernatural explanation and cannot be explained by natural means. This must not be a hypothetical. This must be something that does in fact occur that you can provide sourcing as to when and how it occurred. And this must not just be something that is an unsolved mystery that we have yet to figure out. It must be something where the logical conclusion is supernatural. Now that I've laid that out, let me know in the comment section or make a response video. If you think you've got somebody that can, then send this video to them that contains my challenge. Till then, let's get on with the rest of this video. There's not much left. Not that it had any substance throughout anyway. We're using the same method. No, you're not, because intelligent design does not use the scientific method, because the peer review process rips apart creationist claims all the time. In many cases. And many is an unquantifiable term. Good one. They're talking about this philosophy that's being imposed on the evidence. No, they're not. You're trying to create this straw man that science has some kind of internal dogma. There may be some dogmatism in, say, the science communication field, because there are varying methods of science communication that some could have a dogmatic approach to. But the actual fields of science inherently will lack dogma, because the scientific method does not allow for dogma to be one of the mechanisms used when determining the truth factor of any explanation. Again, the peer review process will usually rip something like this to shreds okay you can't implicate someone over six foot tall that's what they're doing no it's not what they're doing what they're doing is excluding the psychic or the medium from being part of the forensic process as i said in the beginning of the video by excluding the psychic or the medium because their explanations will ultimately be supernatural and thus beg more questions they will be excluded from the investigation in the same way that god too would be excluded as an explanatory mechanism because using god as an explanatory factor begs the question a thousand times at Stand to Reason, we help Christians think clearly as they share their worldview with others. And we, of course, end on that note. No, you don't help Christians think clearly about these issues. You obscure them. There are Christians who are scientists who are incredibly honest in their work. These people are not scientists, nor are they honest. It's usually a red flag to me whenever I see a video that contains an obvious quote mine as to what the intent of the speaker is going to be. In this case, the attempt is to undermine the actual explanatory power that science has given towards many of life's questions. Yes. There are things that science hasn't, and in many cases, cannot answer. However, that does not undermine science's utility. The other thing that has been conveyed to the speaker's audience throughout this video is that there's an underlying conspiracy in science rooted in an inner dogmatism. Claims that don't actually pan out when viewed through the lens of reality. Science is a self-correcting process. It's how the scientific method functions, and it's why it works, and it's why it produces consistent results. That self-correcting mechanism roots out dogma, because dogma cannot be used as an explanatory mechanism. It can't even be used as a part of an explanatory mechanism. So practically every claim that has been levied against science in this video is patently false. And now that I'm done slamming my head against a wall at another set of creationists who think that quote mining is an honest approach to, well, anything, I'm going to start working on tomorrow's video, because I made the awful mistake of trying to take a nap yesterday. And instead I woke up today. Life choices, I guess. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and as we roll into the Patreon slides, everyone, insert into video tagline here.